Thank you for joining us this evening in Sydney. It is this evening, but Karen, you're in London. What time is it over there? It is 11.30 in the morning. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Karen Edge. Um, now I've said that, we can just talk like we normally talk as friends. Thank you for talking today about educator wellbeing. Thank you. I think it's an even more important topic now than it was probably when we set up the webinar. That's true. That's, yeah. So what I thought we'd do is just talk about some of the topics we covered in previous webinars, just to get your take on some of the, the concepts we've been talking about. We talked about teacher leaders and do you have some ideas about how teacher leaders are selected or what would be the criteria for teacher leaders? I think one of the things that we've seen in our research is that most teacher leaders or leaders that move through the pipeline are actually selected by the principals in their schools. And that often that process isn't a formal process, but it's one where you tap someone on the shoulder and encourage them to take on extra responsibility. So most of the leaders that we've talked to, that's how they came through the system. It was a principal who said, you know, I think you should consider taking this on. So when we went back and did our second round of interviews, we thought it's really interesting if our Gen X leaders consider themselves to be this sort of hub of, of recruiting and developing new leaders. Are they doing it in a way that has some patterns? So we asked them a set of questions around, you know, what were the skills that the leaders that you've tapped on the shoulder are like? What are the, what's the knowledge they bring? And then we said, did they go to the same school that you did? You know, do they come from the same kind of family yours is? Do they have the same accent you do? Do they solve problems the same way you do? And then the final question was, is, are they the same gender as you? And then are they the same color as you? And right. what was really interesting was you could watch leaders, and we do this now in, in keynotes all the time, but you say to a leader, you know, are you really good at, at shoulder tapping and bringing people through the system and everybody pops up? And then as they start answering the questions, by the time they get to the end, almost everyone will say, oh my gosh, I think I only shoulder tap people who are younger than I am, people who come from the same kind of place and who solve problems the way I do. So wow. what's most interesting for us is to, is to talk to leaders and it's, it's influenced my practice as well. I realize that I shoulder tap a lot of Australians, New Zealanders and Canadians because they bring a certain optimism to the table, a certain we can solve the problem and mm -hmm. just I don't need a lot of extra, I don't have to add any layers of who I am, I can just be myself. So I had to really think about diversifying my shoulder tapping. And I think that for teacher leaders, my biggest worry at the moment is, how well do our leaders understand the patterns of whose shoulder they tap? And what does that mean for the diversity of future leaders? Yeah, because a lot of people aren't um, clear with whether they want to go on to that leadership journey. I know at one school we had a uh, totally a uh, few different groups and we thought who would lead the group and everyone said oh so and so and so and so they always love doing that sort of work but when we opened it up to the entire staff it was really surprising who put their hand up or if you I had a conversation with one person I thought I thought you'd be really good at it and they said well if you think I can do it maybe I actually can so it was just a little bit of encouragement but it definitely wasn't a shoulder tap but I think some people just need um, a voice in, in that situation. <laughs> I think it, it's almost a lateral shoulder tap, right? So the shoulder tap doesn't always have to come from above. It can also no. come, even come from below. But I think as we go through, I'm, I'm incredibly envious of your Australian COVID situation. And I've talked to some colleagues who are like, we haven't had a new case in weeks. And there's sort of, now we have global envy in terms of how well you've controlled your disease. But one of the things that I'm noticing here in London and other places is, who's getting tapped on the shoulder is very much predicated by what your responsibilities are at home. So right. in some ways, as we go forward, and I'm not quite sure how this is playing out in schools, but as we go forward in organizations, we really have to think about the question you've just said, which is, have you asked who wants to participate or have you made an assumption about who wants to participate? And one of the things that I've repeatedly said at work is, just ask and if somebody can't say yes they will tell you and they need to be able to say no without judgment but if they don't feel asked their engagement coming back post covid they will feel disengaged and unrecognized whereas i think that's something that until you're the person who's at home with the nine-year-old and everybody knows that it's very difficult for people to see that we need to ask everyone give everyone the voice and the choice yeah and the chance and the opportunity so we also talked about the importance of teachers um, trusted by their leaders. So we're looking also at that collective efficacy where they're not micromanaged, they're, they believe in each other as a group. Have you got anything, any in your research to talk about that collective efficacy? 
Yeah, I think for us, we did a set of nine case studies, which was quite small relative to the other sort of work that we were doing. We were in London, New York, and Toronto. And what we did is we interviewed 10, teacher in every, in every, 10 teachers in every school, plus the leader that they were working with. And we asked them questions about, you know, what is the most important thing that your leader does for you? And what surprised us was pretty much 95% of the time, the answer was they care for me. And we then started to press around, so well, what does care actually mean? And the bottom line for everyone was, is that they understand that I'm a person outside of school and that I don't need special treatment and I don't need um, special permission, but I need them to know that at some point, somebody might get sick or something might happen. And it doesn't mean I'm less committed as a teacher. It just means that I have a life outside. So it was really interesting for us to see that that you know, expecting people to care for you and that care wasn't, you know, a touchy feely, ask me how I am every five minutes. Care was, you know, how we defined it was around, it's just being consistent. So developing that, that trust is that you are consistent in your actions. So you can predict, you know, I, I can predict probably now that we've worked together a little bit, the kind of responses you would have to most questions. And yeah. I trust that you will have those same responses to me as you would to Pazzi and Carol and you would to Alma and Lynn. Um, and that consistency breeds trust. So I can expect what I need and I don't have to invest all the emotional energy in terms of, in terms of second guessing what, what you may actually answer. So trust for us really comes from that sort of notion of care and understanding what kind of care your people need and then also just being consistent. But I, I like the way that you said care is not checking in or, or all the time and, and knowing all your personal details, but it's that consistency. Yeah. yeah, and being, being able to say, like, what do you need me to know? Over the last, it's probably six months, so I've transitioned from a big job in the center of the university back to being an academic. And I think what's been most interesting for me is really thinking about what do I need someone to know about me for me to trust that they can lead me? So, right. so they need to understand some fundamental things about me, and I need to trust that they can hold those things and help me go forward. And if that's broken, it's really, really difficult. And I think for leaders, it's actually you know, the leaders that we work with and the teams that I lead, I want people to understand more about me so that I can understand a bit more about them and we can find a way in the middle that we can actually move ahead together. But I think that, you know, how much are you willing to tell someone about yourself becomes quite complicated. In England, I'm Canadian, um, <laughs> but we're fine with that. Um, but I think anyway, you have quite a stiff upper lip and you don't want to tell anyone anything. So how you lead in different countries is also really complicated, especially if you come from a country that has different patterns than the country that you're actually leading in at the moment. I think it's coming down to relationships, right? That, that relationship and investing in the relationship as well as the person. So, so in your research, what has been the biggest surprise you found about trust and leadership? Would it be that care? I think it was, and I think the biggest surprise for us was around care, but also around role modeling. So okay. one of the things that was really interesting was that we talked to, you know, these ri very quickly rising leaders through education systems in big global cities that were dynamic and exciting. And one of the things that they said was that they had worked for great leaders on their way yeah. up. They had worked for bad leaders on their way up, which had taught them equally as many things, yeah. but they had never, none of them had ever worked for a leader who had showed them how to be a great leader in school, but also have a life outside of school. And one thing we know about generational theory is that, you know, our boomers are the ones who are just about to retire. The Gen Xers are probably now hitting sort of late 40s um, to early 40s. And then we've got millennials coming up. The younger the generations are, the more committed they are to work-life balance and to having balance outside the house. So we are still, as governments, shaping leadership career pathways and trajectories for boomers who, you know, we know characteristically worked like dogs, often mm -hmm. when they were leaders. So they're, they're children. I'm a child of a boomer and my dad worked every night. He came home for dinner, but then would you know, go into the basement and he would be there for hours working. I'm really committed to making sure that I don't work too much for my son and driven by that because I love my dad, but I probably would have liked to spend a bit more time with him. So what's interesting is what we've tried to do in our research now is the big finding was, if you can't see someone doing the job you would like to do in the way you want to do it, you will opt out. Yeah. So the biggest challenge for us when we talk about recruitment and retention is that if you can't see a leader that you can look up to as a leader and as a person, there is the all likelihood is that you do not want that job. So when we look at the recruitment and retention pipeline, one of the things we do, it's not really fair to put any more burden on school leaders. 
but it's really, really helpful to say to them, if you are not modeling your work-life balance and well-being, how you need it to look in a way that other people think is doable, mm -hmm. no one will ever want your job. So you are the best advertisement for why being a leader is good. And it doesn't mean glossing it over. It just means telling the truth, but making sure you have a life outside, that will be the key thing to you know, increasing the number of people who actually want the job. Yeah, I think I was telling you the story that um, one of the principals I worked with, she would come around and she'd say she would never leave school until she checked in on all the teachers and she said no if you're still here i'll still be here but you need to go home with your family she she role modeled for us you know 5 30 she was gone and she didn't want anybody else staying around there and that was a really good good experience for me because i carried that through you know you have to have that balance i think one of the things that's interesting is that we've seen leaders who do what your leader did but or send people home and say look um Andrea, we really need you, like, we need you to go home. Often I would get, oh, you have a child now, you need to go home, which I find quite difficult because there's lots of my friends who don't, who would desperately want them. Um, so that bias seeps in. But what's interesting is that they would say, you know, you go home and take care of your family, I'll do the work for you. And whereas leaders, we often think that that is us caring for our staff by reducing their workload. The message that they were actually sending was that being a leader is ridiculous because you have to do your leadership job and then everyone else's job so they can have work life balance. So it's, it's interesting to see how those those strategies play out. I've just seen a, a question in the in the Q&A about how much you share and about, you know, being comfortable with how much you share and the person says um, I'm very private and my mentor has been trying to get me to be more open and I think there's a my response to that would be. I used to think that being a leader meant that I had to be a certain way. And I think organizations will have norms in terms of how you do it. And I also thought that if I shared more of who I was, that I would be weaker. But what I've interested, um, what I find really interesting is my grandfather used to say that if you're ill, you should never own your illness. You should never say my diabetes or my arthritis, because as soon as you give it a pronoun, you own it. And right. what you need to do is set some boundaries on what it is. So my, my advice for what it's worth would be by saying that I'm very private, you're setting up a cycle where you won't share because you're private. My guess is, is that even my friends who say, you know, I'm incredibly private, when they feel safe and when they know that the benefit of them being open, not about everything, but about sort of turning a few pages of the book, not opening the book, um, it's actually quite cathartic and liberating, but you need the safe space to do it. You need to trust the person you're doing it with. And it's practice. It's the same as, you know, it's the same as everything else we do. I'm, I'm pointing this way. My nine-year-old is sort of around the house. Now. <laughs> One of the things with Isaac is, is when things are tough, like if, if being a bit more open is hard, of course it's going to be hard. You've never done it before. And I think it's everything that we do around well-being and work-life balance, it's the same sort of muscle training that you yeah. would do you know, if you were at the gym lifting weights. You have to practice and you're gonna practice and you're gonna fail and you're gonna practice and you're gonna feel bad, but it's literally just practice. I'm hearing the word vulnerable. You have to sometimes be vulnerable to let other people in. And, and yeah. as you said, you don't have to tell them everything in your life, mm -hmm. but you have to build up that trust. And I think storytelling is a wonderful way, your own story. You know, it doesn't have to be about work. It can be something else that you're interested in as well. So it builds a relationship, builds a trust. And I think just little bits, little steps. So when we talk, we talk about school improvement and sort of, you know, in, in my field as in yours, there's all sorts of different models of school improvement. And one of the things that I will always say is school improvement models are like hooks. So every school has to find the, the thing that works for them and then they can hook their school onto the model that works and then off they go. I think it's the yeah. same with trust and vulnerability. You have to find the bits that you're comfortable with sharing yeah. and putting on the hook. But you also have, there's also timing. So um, I see a comment from Julie Slater, who's a colleague of mine in, uh, in England. And Julie will know, I, go, I do an annual women in leadership talk for her and you know, 100 colleagues. And they were with me over the journey of being injured, being on crutches for 500 days, having surgery, being better, and then getting divorced. And so what's interesting is there were times over that journey for me, which has been the last three years or four years where I couldn't be vulnerable because even opening a tiny bit, I could not handle the emotional, the, the, I just needed to keep it clamped down with 18 layers of jumpers over top. And that was it, I couldn't talk about it. But then I realized that just sort of slowly 
opening and taking a little step forward made it possible. But it was those little steps. It wasn't, you know, you don't go from being private to not private overnight. No. But you can, if somebody can see in you, you know, by somebody understanding that I'm now a single parent 70% of the time, the number of people I get calls from saying, how is it that that works? And do you, did you read any books that were helpful? And I will say quite openly, you know, I was injured and I learned a lot about ability. And, you know, how do you manage a bank line? You know, make sure that anyone with a cane goes ahead of you because in all likelihood, they're in pain. Mm -hmm. So all of the little bits of your own journey will resonate with different people. And as a leader, you need to sort of expand your repertoire because you will connect with different people on different fronts. That's true. And uh, I'm hearing empathy too, empathy for others. So the other question, why should society care about teacher and leader well-being? <laughs> So in our house at the moment, we have lifted the swearing ban. Um, so we're, my nine-year-old and I are allowed to swear as long as it's not in anger and not at someone else. So before we sat down, I was like, what if she asks me a question and my response is a swear? So <laughs> my response would be a swear. Um, but, I, but I think we need to care. So you, one of the things about COVID, especially the discussions we're having in England, is you, know, you need schools to function and you need schools that that allow kids to grow and develop. And if you have teachers that are not allowed to grow and develop and feel safe and respected, the kids, it, it's sort of a, it's one of those oh nested. And I think what COVID has done, I hope, is made sure that everyone understands the value of our schools and understands why we need teachers in schools. So I think we, the work that we often do, and I'm, I'm leading a meeting later um, next week with the presidents of 10 different principals organizations to say, you know, what is your system doing to take care of the leaders, to take care of the teachers? Mm -hmm. And part of that is that we, we have a responsibility. My biggest worry around teachers and leaders at the moment is that all, as we're reintroducing in England, we see that um, there's going to be, we like inspection here. We, the English, like inspection. As yep. my Canadian, we don't do inspection in Canada. But what's interesting is all of the rubrics that people are setting up are about the easy things. Like, you know, we can measure how far a desk needs to be apart. We can take out all the soft furnishings. We can make sure kids bring their own lunch. But I have not seen a risk assessment that has teacher leader well-being on it. And one of the things, there's a colleague of mine, and I'm happy to send a set of resources after, there's a colleague of mine in London who is starting to work on a re-entry curriculum for children around what are the things that they need to talk about. Do they need to talk about grief? Do they need to talk about you know, sadness and the great parts of lockdown? And I think we need to start thinking really clearly about a re-entry protocol and risk assessment for teachers and leaders. Because I think as a society, we owe it to them because they are our frontline workers. And as a profession, we owe it to ourselves to take care of each other. And if we don't start having the conversation about, you know, I know that you've probably been involved in those difficult conversation workshops. And usually they're not about well-being. Usually they're about performance. Yes. And why is it that we don't have a set of well-being protocols around difficult, like around well-being conversations? So another colleague I work with has started to think through with me a little bit about how could we create a set of templates to help people practice asking people about their well-being? Um, you know, not did you go for a run this morning, but you know, are, are you okay? And that that then becomes part of performance assessments. It becomes part of re-entry into schools. But I think, um, you know, my ex-partner is a teacher and he's a key worker. So they're still in school here. Um, and in England, we're having big, big debates about whether or not it's safe to open schools. And I think every country has a different way of talking about teachers. Mm -hmm. And we spend quite a lot of time in our research talking about the narrative that exists in a country about teachers and the role that the press plays in that and the role that parents play in that. And so, in where they talk nicely about teachers, shockingly, they have less of a recruitment problem. So with Ed's feeling a little bit disposable or they question how society values them, how can teachers take ownership of their well-being? So, I mean... In our study, we we working in three cities and we're working with about 30 or 40 leaders in each one, sort of with a recurring rolling every year. We went and talked to them for three years. And what we saw was that in every city, there was someone who almost died. And they almost died because they did not care for their well-being. And for some of them, it was the level of stress that they were under. For some of them, it wasn't exercising anymore. But it wasn't until they got to that breaking point that they made the decision that, okay, enough. 
And what I think is really interesting is that having a leader that prioritizes it is really important. But at some point, it is actually up to us to make that choice ourselves. And no one is going to choose to get your butt to the gym. No one is going to choose to, you know, make you a healthy drink instead of a Coke. Um, this is no, in no way slamming Coke. As <laughs> I said yesterday, I drank two Diet Dr. Peppers because they happened to be in the house. That was my like COVID excitement. Um, <laughs> oh, Dr. Pepper. Oh. Well, it's yeah, I'm allergic to cherries, so it's like a big risk. But anyway. <laughs> It was where I was stressed out and I don't really do anything else that's bad. So that was my big, my well-being yes. ask. It was to die, Dr. Peppers. But what, what I think is really interesting is that it is, you have to make that choice yourself. And then you have to be really clear about what does that mean and who's, what's the response going to be? So there are colleagues of mine who will say quite explicitly, I answer emails at nine in the morning or at five at night. So if you get in in that window, I'll reply. And if you don't, you're just going to have to wait. There's colleagues of mine who say, I don't, I won't answer any emails after five o'clock. I'm turning off my phone or I won't do work on the weekend. And what's interesting is that there's a set of what I advise sort of my mentees and what I try and do, but badly most of the time is what are the things that are getting in the way of you feeling healthy and happy? So it will be different at different times. I think the, the overwhelmingness of it is you make a decision about I'm going to do yoga every day for the rest of my life. And that's really difficult. But yeah. if you say I'm going to do yoga for the next three days and we'll see how that goes, it's much easier to get your head around. So well, you don't need the guilt either. If you don't, you know, have those expectations of yourself and then you don't meet them, you actually feel worse about the whole. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, that's part of it. So how do you do it in a way that doesn't make you feel bad? Number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, as, as a leader or as a teacher in England and many of the other countries that I work in, if you ask a group of leaders, if they feel they have good work-life balance and work-life balance defined as, you know, incredibly subjectively, are you happy with how you distribute your time over the course of your day? One of the things that you will see is, so I'll often ask them on a scale of one to 10, one being it's horrific and 10 being it's amazing. And you watch the hands go up. There's quite a few that hit around six or seven. And there may be five or six who get to the sort of eight, nine, 10, which we would like to be much higher. And you, but the people at that end are putting their hands up like this. And I will make them put their hand up because I'm supportive. And then I will say, you know, what do you think of people who say I've got a good work-life balance? And consistently it's, they're not doing well enough at their job. They're lazy. They're this, they're that. Um, none so that, which, judge, that judgmental side's judgment. coming straight in. Yeah. So, you know, you and I were talking about the fact that I'm, I'm working on Canadian time at the moment. So I have, you know, I, I wash dishes. I live in a very old house in England. So I wash dishes and talk to my sister-in-law around one o'clock in the morning and that she's making dinner. And um, so I go to bed really late because Isaac is going to bed later because he's playing with his Canadian cousins. And I have quiet time between about 10 and three. The amount of judgment that people are applying to that is extraordinary. So I've learned that I can send my emails a bit later and people don't know. Um, I can do all these things to mitigate that. But it occurred to me a couple of days ago that if I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning, like some of my colleagues do, they are seen as terribly organized, mm -hmm. dedicated, calm people. Whereas the night owls are only staying up because they're not well organized. So there's judgments that we all make about people and the choices that they make that I think we have to be really, really careful about. So once you make that choice, you need to make sure you've got enough people around you that will support you in your choice and help you get sort of over the, the well-being line. But, but watch how you judge different people. Even, even I do it. I look at my early riser friends and I'm like, oh, how dedicated they are. And then I look at myself and go, oh, you must not be organized. But at the end of the day, we're working the same hours. We're just choosing to work them at different times. Different hours. Yeah. yeah. So you're talking about then boundaries, but I also like that you said you surround yourself with people who support that. Yeah. I, it's for me, I think I probably have less people around and because I live on my own now, um, although we are doing, have you seen the Ryan Heffington dancing guy from Los Angeles? You need to look this up. Except okay. the fact that I always call him Hef, I, I, I always call him Hef, Heffernan after Amanda. So I, oh. now she, she, she's, she's, <laughs> she's now a dancer in, in uh, Los Angeles, but he runs, he's choreographed the Sia video. He's amazing. And he started mm -hmm. doing dance, dance 
classes for an hour. So Isaac and I have decided now as part of our well-being, we're going to do one Ryan Heffer, Heffington a week. You should totally check him out. <laughs> uh, so I'll my, get you my, to tweet it out later for me. I know, my, my balance is coming from a nine-year-old, so I, I do not play Fortnite. But what's interesting is my balance comes from the people who know what my life looks like when it's not working well. So I have a set of tells, like well-being well, tells. I really want you to go into this because this, when we talked about this, this is something that really resonated with me. It was really interesting. So before lockdown here, I did a keynote in Ireland. And what one of the dip, most difficult things for me about lockdown is that I realize now that I walk and think. And because I'm with a nine-year-old and it's just the two of us, we have to, if I walk anywhere, I'm walking with him, which is great for mother-kid bonding time, but it's not really great for thinking. And our garden is not terribly big because we live in London. So me walking around the garden is not helpful. But what I realized when I was in Ireland is I went for a really long walk and I knew that lockdown was coming because I was supposed to be going to Shanghai and it was canceled and I was going to Doha and it was canceled. So we knew that it was moving west. Twice, yeah. And so I went for a walk and I thought, okay, what, what is the thing that I can talk about that might be the most helpful for people heading into lockdown? So the first thing I said when I started my keynote was we are about to head into an era where you need to be able to land in your authenticity. And I hate authenticity and vulnerability as sort of words, because I think they, they put people off. But my advice was we, we all have to get better at knowing who we are and being clear about that in order for other people to be able to, um, to understand what you need. So the second thing I did is I said to them, last night, it occurred to me that I am not well. And everyone just kind of recoils. <clears throat> and I said, there were indications of this over the last two weeks. And I said, if I look back, I know exactly what they were because I spotted them and thought, ooh, that isn't good. So what happened is for me is I walked them through what it looked like and sort of the six things that had happened. So I found the pepper grinder in the laundry basket. Mm -hmm. Right. We, have, we like pepper. We have two pepper grinders. So there was one where it should be and one in the laundry basket. I then found like the coffee bean grinder in the fridge. Not ideal. I then managed to lock myself out of the house twice. Like all of these, and for me, these are escalating things. During this time, I'd also been working really, really late, but I had discovered that now the new Mac Outlook, you can send your emails later. So we had the combination of misplaced things in the house, emails really, really late, but I was masking that. And the only person who caught that I was working ridiculous hours was an Australian friend. So I then went to the gym, proud of myself, finished class, went to get in the car. The keys were in the car. And I have my ex-mother-in-law's car. And the only person with keys was my ex-sister-in-law, who is lovely. So she came to rescue me. And I'm like, wow, this is really not like, I must okay. be talking. I flew to Ireland. I get to the hotel. And what do I not have? My passport. So I was now in another country without my passport, doing a keynote, flying out the next day. I have never once in the, you know, I fly way too much and I do offsetting and we don't have a car usually. However, I had lost my passport and I was like, okay, so if I look at the escalation of the tells, I know that when I'm working really late, except for now that I'm on campus at the time, it's because I'm stressed out, but I'd hidden that. Before. I had started to lose household objects in places they did not belong. I then locked myself out of the house twice, which means that I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. I then locked the keys in the car well, as I was going to tend to my well-being, and then I lost my passport. So um, <laughs> one of the things that I made them do an exercise, which I can put up as a slide, I can tweet it at later, which was basically saying, what are you, do you know what your well-being tells are? Like if you had to put four things that you know you do when you are starting to burn out or not yeah. as healthy, and then the question I posed to them was, is as we go into this era in schools, as a leader, can you make sure that there's, for every person in your building, there is someone who knows their well-being tells. So they can ask them specifically how it's going or just watch out for them. Because yeah. if you don't have people that know what your, you know, what your tells are, and it's not a well-being weakness, it's sort of a pattern of behavior that identifies to you that things might be able to, you know, not go in the direction you want. So it was, it was really interesting. And I've had some feedback from that session and we did it again um, with colleagues at the Women in Leadership Seminar. And it was incredibly powerful because I think we often rarely pause and think, 
we know the things we're supposed to do to be well, but have we identified the things that are clear for us when we're not doing those things? Good signs. I know my children will say to me, um, I remember in, when I was living in America, I had a lot of assignments and then the computer crashed, lost the computer, lost all my assignments, had exams. And I couldn't name the sponge. You know, the thing that you clean the kitchen sink with, and I'm, I, I couldn't get it to them. And so they always remember mum when you couldn't remember the name of a sponge. So that's been their telltale sign. They go, oh, we know mum's now going to be mixing her words up and not knowing. Would they know that about me when I'm stressed out? But it's interesting because that's something. So the thing I think to think about is that there's the overt things that other people will notice. And then there's the things that they won't. So for some reason, so, I mean, lockdown for us has been a bit stressful, but we're, you know, I sent us flowers yesterday to, and I sent them, I signed them to Karen and Isaac. Congratulations for rocking, the uh, rocking lockdown. Love Karen, love Karen and Isaac. Um, <laughs> at the same time, it's stressful, but I, I keep forgetting van, like T-H-E-N and T-H-A-N. So it's little things that like, there's, there's a few things that when sort of that kind of reg, and then of course you panic that, I have dementia or I'm having some sort of bigger problem because we're in a lockdown. But it's amazing for me that I know when I start forgetting those things and I pride myself on great grammar and spelling, that that means that I need to take a bit of a step back. Yeah. So I, I, I love the idea though of having other people you work with being a partner in your well-being, as in recognizing the things. I like that idea. Well, I think, and um, there's a few people that have mentioned sort of, you know, fear of judgment and the need for mutual trust is really important. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about control and how much can you control and what's outside your control, you let go. And what's inside your control, you hold on to and make stronger. And I think that you need to, where, whatever organization you work in, there's people that you, you gravitate to. And I think part of it is, is making sure that those kinds of conversations that you have are the ones that you need to have. And yeah. I think- some of us, you know, those, those tight connections of people that take care of us are often at home. And then we have a, work, a workplace that's completely different. And I think what I'm hoping we see as we come out of COVID is a lot of the kindness and sort of willingness to talk about how things are or aren't going. We carry that back into our schools. And I think some countries are much, much better at that than others. Yeah. So you know, that trust, mutual trust is important. And I think it's, it's harder for us in England because the principals have all of the authority over the teachers. So where some people will disagree when I say this, it is really relatively from a global standard, it's really easy for a principal to be in a teacher. Um, you know, it doesn't take terribly long and there are instruments you can use, even if it's a great teacher and just not a good fit. Mm -hmm. So I think the relationship in some countries between a principal and a teacher is, is built on a foundation that makes that mutual trust that much more difficult because you need to overcome that imbalance before you can enter the relationship. So I think mutual trust is something that we, we all have to work on. And I think it comes down to being predictable and being caring. And as we go back into schools and you've been open for quite a while, but as we go back, there's a moment that we can try and create some longstanding change. And I'm, I'm just hoping that we're committed to doing that across the piece. Okay, well, I'm going to read out some of these questions for you. This is from Carolyn Martin. Surely the issue around self-disclosure is the underlying intention, meeting your needs versus sharing to help the other person. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a variety of ways to look at it. There's sort of, there are things that I don't talk about terribly openly because I think that it's just not helpful or not appropriate or wouldn't be necessary. Um, I do know that, so legally, you're not required to self-disclose a variety of things. There are protections around disclosing particular things so that if you have disclosed an ability issue or um, you know, anything that falls within the sort of protected characteristics yeah. that you are protected from that. And it's because there's so much inherent bias in the, the systems that we work in. Um, but I think it's, there is, you have the right to share the things that you need to share to feel efficacious at work. But as a leader and as a colleague, sometimes you are sharing to help that other person. And there's a, there's a difficult balance between that and it won't be the same. So you and I have a conversation and you share something about your experience that will help me. You're probably sharing it to help me at that point. And then this afternoon you can turn around and have a different conversation with someone where you're actually sharing because it helps you. So yeah. I think the, the most important thing for me is that it changes and, 
in in COVID times, we've been having conversations about, you know, some days are good and some days are bad. And we've now broken that down to like some half days are good and some half days are bad. And now we've yeah. just gotten to that. This hour sucks. <laughs> you know, the next hour is going to be great. And yeah. I think that's where sort of intention and disclosure, it's the same sort of thing at this moment in this particularly safe environment, this is what I feel will be most helpful for everyone. Yeah. And that's a very personal decision to make. Okay, thanks, Karen. And this one's from Karen. Is there a research instrument used in determining the well-being of teachers? There, there are. I think there's, um, there's a really interesting one for the well-being of leaders. Um, and the person I would go to is Phil Riley. So he is, at, I know Andrea knows him quite well. I, what I'll do is I'll, all these resources you've talked about, I'll send them to all the participants. Yeah, and we can sort of collate those. There's a, there's a bunch. I've been sort of, I've been saving things I've read. I have a, a list of things I've been sending out to people each week. But what's interesting is that I think um, there, there's a few instruments that measure well-being. What I would say is that if you're particularly looking at a school and a school with a particular set of issues, um, a standardized well-being assessment may actually not be what you're looking for. There may be better ways to ask the question and better things to do. So if um, you want to send a bit more information, you don't have to do it in the Q&A, but just as an email after and say specifically, I'm interested in a well-being instrument that would measure uh, teachers in this type of school or for this type of issue, we can sort of fine tune what's available to you. Terrific. Um, Emma Kell, me too. I forgot the names of the basic household object. Oh, she's just telling, she's telling us that she agrees that you know, there's some objects that she feels. Glad somebody relates to me on that one. Um, Marie Wheatley, Whiteley, she says, being allowed to be vulnerable, building mutual trust and openly talking about well-being are the silver linings from this COVID experience. I've noticed the nice kind of tone on social media. Let's hope this lasts. Have you noticed... What I've noticed on social media, I was talking to Katina Pollock today and I'm saying how so many principals and schools are sharing um, across Twitter, like their timetables, their online, their remote learning processes, everything they've been sharing a lot more. And also I think their vulnerability if I've they've had a bad day. I, I, I see that too. We have... Um... Anthony Smith is our vice president of education at UCL and he's been so as, as an academic I work from home a decent amount and so it's, it's quite normal for me but for him it was completely not normal he's a pharmacist and what's really interesting is that he tweets like day you know day 48 and he always tweets a picture of himself having coffee from his balcony but then he'll put a comment about how he's feeling and yesterday he said today was not the best day for people being kind and appreciative I hope tomorrow's a better day and I think it's really interesting that even in our university leaders, depending on who they are, they're being much more vocal about when things aren't right. And they're also being much more willing to say that, you know, something just hasn't gone well. I think in England, we have a lot of competition between our schools um, yeah. because we're a very, very decentralized system. And whereas in other, other countries or jurisdictions, there's been a curriculum that's been set and a way of delivering things that have been set that then all the schools can use to reduce the burden on head teachers and teachers. And I think we've seen that in, in England, a lot of people sharing and a lot of people stepping out that wouldn't have stepped out before. So it's made some space for some new voices. But what we see now, that as the tension in London rises and England rises of the government saying, we're gonna ease lockdown and schools are gonna have to go back in, you can feel the anxiety starting to build. So as a parent and as a governor, um, you know, amongst my teacher friends, amongst my head teacher friends, as they scramble because they care about keeping their people safe, you have less time to be kind. And so the, you know, the muscles of kindness got a real workout during COVID, but remembering that those muscles are there and you had trained them and that that's what you expect going forward, I think is really, really important. So yeah, it's, it's, We've had those discussions at home. So as I point to my nine-year-old, he's been, <laughs> and it's what you expect of yourself. So if you had asked me if I would be the mom of a kid who played six hours of Fortnite a day, um, I would have sworn and said. Mm. You're allowed to but, swear at the moment. <laughs> but what's, just for those of you who just joined, we've removed all the swearing barriers in our house, but I'm being very well behaved today. Um, but what's interesting is that I've had to accept the fact that for my own well-being and my ability to tend to what I need to do, I actually need to allow him to play Fortnite. But what's been, because he plays with his friends and they talk to each other about other stuff. They've talked about politics, they've talked about homework. But what I hadn't anticipated was, kids don't know a lot about digital kindness. 
So I, they set up a WhatsApp group and I took Isaac aside and said, and I'm fully aware of the privilege that Isaac and I bring to the table and said, you need to set some rules for this group. You need to work with your friends, your nine-year-old boyfriends and decide what's okay and what's not okay. And I said, you need to carry that through because you have to protect everyone else. And there's been a few incidents of sort of online not kindness. And I've had to sort of intervene, but I've watched Isaac start to learn how to intervene and exercise his kindness muscles. But it, it takes a lot of practice and it's happening at every level. So whereas teachers and leaders have been kinder and more overt in many cases, if kids are on their own, not digitally connected, they may not have been practicing. And then there's kids like Isaac who've been practicing and have a, you know, a barracuda mom who's like, if you are not kind, you know, you will lose your switch from now till eternity. <laughs> so it's, it's the kindness is coming up in all sorts of different ways. But I think I've made a commitment to some of the practices that I've put in place during COVID. Like I, I work way too much and I work a lot when Isaac's not here so that when he's here, we can hang out. So yeah. now that he's here and I'm stretching things a bit, like we instituted an arts curriculum in our house. Um, and the arts curriculum involves a Will Ferrell movie every week. Yes, um, <laughs> you tell me about it. Which is brilliant. So um, that's one of the things. And I've also talked to friends more. Like, you know, you and I had our second ever, you know, face-to-face face -face virtual conversation. There's a, another colleague of mine I check in with once every week or two weeks in Australia. I talked to Katine and I put a weekly chat in the diary. And we've made a commitment to talk a little bit about work, but a little bit about life in general. So I think, you know, the, the bat signal we my girlfriends and I, they live around the world and it's the same as many of us, but I'm not very good at reaching out for help when I need it. And I've, I've gotten much better at that during COVID at being able to reach out and say, I have a, a problem and I don't know how to solve it. And I just need you to think through this with me. And I hope that for me personally, my reflection on COVID is that I want to keep that going, but I know that it will take some really deliberate action to do that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know I've been reaching out to a lot of the people that I met at Marrakesh um, just to see how they are and, and see what they're dealing with in their part of the world because everyone's in a different situation. So what I get from that is just that connection, but I also learn how lucky I am. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I, think, I think the issue for Australians, so I don't know how many Australians are on the call, but the issue for Australians now, and we always talk about sort of the, the education race, right? So who's who's sitting there in Pisa and who's doing what. And my big, I have two sort of pressing worries that are sort of really getting to me at the moment. One is, as I watch all my friends in other places come out of lockdown with sort of a, a buoyant enthusiasm and beaches, that's really it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> what, what that feels like, sort of the, you know, there's, there's a, it really challenges you to think, you know, I am really, really happy for you and your sunsets. But at the same time, I would really like to beat you up. And then the flip side, my other sort of worry coming out of COVID is that I don't know how much distancing you're doing in your schools, because depending on your rates, but um, here when kids go back to school, they're going to have to be socially distant or physically distant. So what they're doing is dividing classes into half. So you only have 15 kids. So even in early years where they're used to sitting together and sort of licking each other, they're going to be at desks that are apart. So we have a lot of EYFS early years foundation teachers who are going in who are gonna know that kids succeed in, in kindergarten because they have access to this type of learning. And now they're not gonna have access to that type of learning anymore. So I worry a little bit on re-entry, how do we yeah. support the teachers who are walking in with, I know this to be true because of my training. I know this to be true because of my professional experience. And I know this to be crazy because this is what I've been told I have to do to bring kids back into school. How do we support people moving back into that? And I think that the one good adult comment about building your re resilience is really important. Making sure you've got people that you can go to and talk to that don't think you are anything but genuinely asking for help. Yeah. That's from Carolyn Martin. Having a strong working alliance with a work buddy is so important. It speaks to the concept of one good adult, which is a key predictor of resilience. So thank you, I, I would also say for, for someone like me who lives sort of in, in Greenwich Mean Time and, and works around the world, and a lot of my strongest bonds are in Canada, I think if you aren't in the place where you're from and you still have a lot of um, allegiance to the place that you're from, you're sort of the one good adult concept. It's really 
good to sort of blend that around the world or around your neighborhood or around so you've got one good adult in a variety of different places i actually have now a time zone system where pretty much if there was any major crisis at any time of the day there's at least one person i could call who would be up which works pretty well for me so, yes I yes, I know. I, I remember speaking to you one night and then Jeremy you know, was on there too. And I'm like, well, you've got a baby. You've got an excuse. Karen's on Canadian time. You've both got excuses to be able to talk to me during the day. I have got another question for you. How do we entice students into this profession when they're all seeing that the media and um, when teachers aren't feeling like they're really, um, that society isn't valuing them? How, how does that affect the students coming through? I think it's really interesting. So when you become, you know, if you want to be a doctor, you know, you think about what, I think there might be some sports going on outside, which is good. He's taking responsibility. We've traded seven pounds 99 of V bucks on Fortnite for his ability to complete his task lists for the week. So he's done extra homework today and he's putting in extra fitness time so that he can, uh, he can earn the V bucks. Just so he also has memorized my credit card number. Oh, I was um, but he knows he's not to use it till he asks. So I apologize for that. You're going to hear an occasional thump, but just, yeah, we'll work around that. That's um, all good. Okay. I love the so, live webinars. <laughs> sorry. That's um, all good. So I think for, there's two things. Like, so when you go to the doctor when you're little, you know, you meet the doctor and you talk to the doctor and you might think, oh, that's kind of cool. When Isaac would go to a British doctor when he was little, he would come home to play doctor and he would put his dad over here. He would put a chair here. He would put... A, um, a keyboard on top of the chair and he would get his stethoscope and everything and he would leave his dad over there not touch his dad which is a very British way of medicine and then his dad would say hi doctor I need some help and Isaac would do this and say I'm busy and go and that would go on forever so it was really interesting for me to think about okay would he ever want to be a doctor and he might want to be a doctor if he thought all it was was typing and ignoring your patient um, but what was interesting is he got a new doctor and he came home the first day and said, Dr. Singh is amazing. And I said, why? He said, she treats me like a real person. So his concept of the profession changed. He won't mm -hmm. be a doctor. Blood, he's announced. Um, but when you think about how do you become aware of professions? So teachers are pretty much the only profession where every single day they have contact time with someone who might enter their profession. So the teachers who love their job and who do it and talk nicely about it are probably doing something quite good for future recruitment. I think parents have a big role. There are lots mm -hmm. of parents. You go, Isaac goes to a great state funded school and there's lots of parents um, who love the school and talk amazingly about it. But there's parents who say, you know, school's dull and boring and who would want to be a teacher? That is not helpful at all. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the messaging about the profession, a couple of years ago, I bought, uh, I have a, I have a habit, which is not terribly helpful, um, not that expensive, but I buy URLs. So if I'm up in the middle of the night and I have a really good idea, I'll be like, ooh, I should buy the URL. And then I'll go and see if it's available and then buy it. Yeah. So I bought the real people of education across the board, the UKs, the comms and everything, because I think at some point when either I have time or find a decent partner, storytelling around why working in education is amazing is something that collectively across the world we're gonna have to do because the profession needs better branding, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, need, we need a marketing agent because <clears throat> we do fantastic work. Without us, countries would fail. Um, without us, children would be so, so much poorer for what they can learn in school. But at the same time, we don't celebrate enough. Like thank a teacher day, it's like Mother's Day or Father's Day. Like it is a full time, 365 day a year job. We should have just thank a teacher every day. Yeah. Um, Right, so it's it's that same sort of thing. I think um, uh, there was a there was an episode of Madam Secretary. I don't know if you watched it, but if you're into leadership, watching it is quite good. And her husband is out for for lunch with with their daughter, and they he's looking at the menu and he's like kale, kale for fifteen dollars. I don't know if you've seen this one. And he's like, what, whatever happened to spinach? Like spinach, way better for you, like really healthy. And there's no ten fifteen dollars. He says spinach needs better branding and marketing. And I think that for me is the same sort of click. We need better branding and marketing to recruit people in. And once you're in, if you have responsibility for other adults, act like you enjoy your job. And if you don't enjoy your job, you either find a way to enjoy it, ask for help, and look at the little things that might be small signals that you don't. Most teachers I know love their job, 
but there's little things they do like walk really quickly. Um, if you're running from place to place and always look really busy, um, you're not necessarily gonna look like you're enjoying yourself. You're looking like you'd rather be at the gym. So we have a lot of those little tells that we've been working on with our team. Yeah, I, I, I've got to say, I um, do the Renaissance Women Leaders Network. We did that. I did that for um, uh, Dr. Bryony Scott ran that and Nicole Archard, Dr. Nicole Archard. And I, Bryony asked me to get up on, my, on the stage and tell the story of how I got into education. And there were people there who'd known me for years and they came up and they went, I never knew that about you. I didn't know you were a mature age student. I didn't know you didn't go to university until the age of 30. And I said, that's education, something I always wanted to do. And I went, I'm so pleased we heard your story tonight. And I never thought of it, but I think that's really important to tell people about how passionate you are about what you do. Well, and also that there's different ways in and different reasons why you go in. Um, there's people who go in because it looks like it will be more flexible. There's people who go in because they've always wanted to teach since they were little. Um, you know, everyone has a reason. Every reason is equally as valid. Mm. So one, one of the things that I wanted to, to, there's two things that I wanted to mention if we hadn't. And I think one, one is around a lesson that I learned from a colleague of mine at UCL named Catherine Stowe. And as we talk about well-being, I try and mention this every time because it was one of those moments for me that changed a little bit about how I approach my work. One of the things that she said to me, we were going through some issues I was having and chatting over coffee. And uh, one of the things she said was, if you were serious about trying to make your job more doable and make your life better, the, there's one question you need to ask yourself. And I said, what? She said, every time you come up against something, ask yourself, what would make this easy? And she said, if you ask yourself that question about what would make this easy or easier, if easy is too much, you start to be able to strip away some of the things that make it difficult. And as it gives you a sense of control over the fact that you can actually move forward. So I think one of the things that I'll often say to the groups that I'm coaching with people I'm working with is like, okay, if you were going to solve this problem, what would make it easy? And that is what you're going for. And if you can use that as sort of a minimizer of stress on each of the different parts that you're looking at, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And I, I love part of the coaching that we do is for people who just need to break down where, where they need to go, the small steps to take. And then yeah. that, I think, those small steps, that, that is sort of all the, it, it was quite funny. So I was moving, we operate on post-it notes in our house and we have a collection that is, you know, the envy of many, many of my colleagues. But when Isaac has problems, we solve them on post-its. And I was moved, I pulled out a bunch from underneath my, my sofa. And I was thinking, oh, the best thing about lockdown is we're not having these like weekly, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about this? And so for Isaac, I've tried to teach him that just break it down. Like, what are you actually worried about? And what is, we do a lot of what's the worst thing that can happen? What's yep. the best thing that can happen? And it's, it, that itself is, is a practice. Now, I assume that most adults, when you say break it down, don't start going. <laughs> so I get a lot of rap back when, uh, when we break it down. But <laughs> really important there's a there's a comment here um from yeah. Marie that, that every time essential workers are mentioned teachers are never included on that list even though teachers haven't stopped working throughout COVID and schools have been open for children so I'm assuming that you're in England and I, I think it is really sad I think that the government here has done a job we'll just leave it at that um we the most difficult thing for me is that schools have remained open the whole time and we have not acknowledged the fact that our teachers are on the front line and that mm. when you are caring for the children of key workers you're also putting yourself in a more vulnerable health position um, and that has that has direct implications for me because my son can't go and stay with his dad um, so the knock-on of that is really really difficult we've had some issues in england yesterday where the government voted to not support our global health workers that are here working with very small things um, like removing the fee that they have to pay for the NHS. So I think there's a, going to be a lot of our frontline public sector workers, including our um, teachers, who just need to be loved. And when you're in a country where love, how you express love and care um, is often really difficult to discern. I think our leaders have a really big challenge going forward, but I'm, I'm really confident that so many of the principals that I work with here and everywhere else are not only up for the challenge, but they've been leading their schools through this and their communities. I think communities have now realized the role that their teachers and leaders play. And there's, there's a much better um, holistic respect for the work that they do. 
even if it's just like the number of people who are saying, I cannot believe that teachers do this every single day. Thank well, we, had, we had a hashtag called teachers rock. Yeah. And, and we had a lot of celebrities, you know, putting it out there, but you know, it, it was a one or two day event. It would be lovely if it was recognized the year round. And Marie, she's in uh, Western Australia. So. Ah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So I, um, I, what, what's interesting, and so I've been editing a blog, we can send the, the list out of what the view from different places around the world has looked like from an educator's point of view and what, and sort of what the changes and challenges have been. I used your Teachers Rock hashtag. My son, um, I convinced him to do a video for Thank a Teacher Day and somebody had asked him from DFE if he would do it from our Department of Education. So he did it and agreed we could put it on Twitter, but we used your Teachers Rock hashtag so that if it got picked up in Australia, you would know that. Uh, I did see it. He's got your back. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen, for giving up your time. You're so generous as a professional and as a friend. So thank you. And I hope everyone's enjoyed this evening. Thank you very much. It was delightful. And if you have any questions, um, let me know and send them out. We can also send out a set of resources as we go forward. I definitely do that. So thanks cool. so much, Karen, and thank you everyone for joining us. Next week we have Ben Kalia from Western Australia and John Campbell um, from Growth Coaching International, and they're going to be talking about leading in a coaching approach. So looking forward to that. Thanks again, Karen. You're you welcome. rocked it. <laughs> Bye. Bye.